Hello and welcome to The Conversation. My name is Athena and I will be your host in this first segment. And I am joined by Jared, our resident astronomer, mm -hmm. in addition to Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. And in news, we have... Oh, oh and we also oh. have Dada producing the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, and today in news, we have... Yes, a little darkness is helping shed some light. And Orbital ATK announces details for their new rocket. <laughs> and in our second segment, Jared will be interviewing Kale Vahakiola, uh, Yakola, uh, co-founder of Space Nation. And of course, we take a look at your comments and questions from last week's show. This is Tomorrow Orbit 11.16. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, before we get into our news, I want to give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. These people contribute $10 per episode on Patreon or $30 a month on Maker Support. In return, they get their name in all three segments of the show, exclusive access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel, and so much more. Every bit helps, and we would not be able to continue making these awesome shows if it weren't for you. So for a complete list of rewards, or if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head over to patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro. Now, there were some awesome launches today. I am super excited to get into this. Everyday astronaut, would you like to take it over? Yeah. Well, I have to start off. I'm a little mad because this first rocket from the uh, from last week took off literally right when I left Florida. I was so mad. Oh. I was out in Florida last week for Yuri's night. And then the next day, an Atlas V goes off. So let's roll that footage and I'll talk about it. So an Atlas V was taking off uh, from Two, Slick 41, one. which is based and on the complex. Liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket with Aft Space 11 from the United States Air Force. Yeah, there it is. That's an Atlas V that took off at 1913 Eastern Time, which is 2313 UTC, on Saturday, April 14th, 2018, from Slick uh, 41, which is Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, like I said. Now, this was a 551 configuration, uh, which is that five meter fairing, uh, five strap on solids, and a single Centaur upper stage, which is basically the biggest, baddest Atlas V rocket there is currently flying. Um, yeah, this was uh, carrying the uh, payload, which is the AFSPC-11, um, on a mission that was going out uh, to geostationary orbit and, and actually direct injected geostationary orbit, unlike uh, most geostationary transfer orbits. So they did a, an additional uh, burn to get it kind of into near ge geostationary orbit. Um, and this was a continuous broadcasting augmented SATCOM or CBAS communication satellite for the Air Force, as well as... Um, there is also a second satellite in there, the ESPA Augmented Geostation Laboratory Experiment Eagle, which was a technology demonstrator. So this was a military launch. So honestly, we don't have that many details. I've pretty much told you everything we know. Um, but the CBAS satellite will serve as communications relay for senior military commanders. And Eagle, uh, we know that that was built by Orbital ATK. And that's really about all we know from the launch, other than I missed it, and I'm very sad that I missed it. Because look at that, it was so pretty. Ugh. I've never so seen an Atlas V before, so I'm mostly just kind of salty, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such such good footage. Um, I can't wait to see like what actually will come out of that if we can actually get any more information. <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. So, no. um, Shh, so. don't tell anyone we're launching a rocket. <laughs> Remember, these are five solid rocket boosters. Um, so those are the, it's weird that the, the Atlas V does that. It has asymmetrical rocket, uh, solid rocket boosters, which is just really weird. They do that a lot. I love it when they only fly with a single rocket, solid rocket booster. Just looks really silly. But yeah, this had five. So two on one side, three on the other. Yep. And they have to do that so because cool. of uh, some of the outside um, piping on the first stage. So oh, they can't actually right. put them symmetrical because of some of the piping. So wow. Yep. Cool stuff. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, cool. And uh, I see a lot of comments in uh, the chat right now about tests, so I'm super excited to get into this. Oh, uh, so you want to take it over? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just a little excited about it. So. Are you going to talk about it? Wait, who talks about tests? Oh, uh, I... wait. Uh... <laughs> Tim Dodd, the Everdy Astronaut, tell us about Tess. Yeah, tell us about Tess, Tim. Okay, sure. I'll just wing it here. Tess was the, uh, the extraterrestrial exoplanet survey satellite. Um, it launched from Space Launch Complex 40. I'm doing this without notes, so if this is the worst thing you've ever heard, uh, here we go. Space Launch Complex 40 on, what was that, Tuesday something? Where are that I was don't think April eighteenth at twenty two fifty one and thirty seconds coordinated universal time. Uh, uh, it was a new Falcon Nine booster that lofted tests, which stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. As I read from my space pod here, um, so uh, <laughs> it was launched into a transfer orbit with a low point of two hundred and eighty four kilometers and a high point of two hundred and seventy thousand kilometers. Wow. And that second stage, they burned the engine again after spacecraft separation in order to put the second stage into a heliocentric orbit. Now, the first stage did make a landing out on the drone ship in the Atlantic, as we can see right here. Uh, always love seeing those grid fins going back and forth as they're fighting for control because you can actually make a stick generate lift if you get it uh, just right as it falls back in. So there it is coming in. Woo. And look at that on the left. Signal through landing. Wow, amazing. So it, miracles do happen, I guess. So it's <laughs> so uh, a great mission overall, and very excited uh, about the transiting exoplanet survey satellite. Here's spacecraft separation. As it, you can see, it's gaining altitude incredibly rapidly um, on the indicators over in the top right of the screen, and then spacecraft separation right there. Uh, they're going to check out uh, tests throughout the weekend, uh, and then continue to do maneuvers with it and actually use the moon as a part of its gravitational slingshot to put it into uh, orbit around the Earth, which will then allow it to hunt uh, for exoplanets. Not like Kepler, where it was just a small spot in the sky, but actually really basically the entire sky, 85% of it. Um, so very excited for that. We'll actually talk about so it in the space cool. pod a little bit later today. So, so excited for that. Oh, mm -hmm. man, the amount of research that's going to come out of it. Um, yes. Yes. Well, I guess if you're going to be talking about it later, then uh, there was a question I saw in here um, about how many reaction wheels they put on tests. This is from Tokawi. I'm not sure if you actually know that. Oh, uh, um, yeah, I actually yeah. don't know that exactly. Uh, okay. Standard, I know Kepler had uh, four reaction wheels on board, yeah. um, but I don't know how many tests actually has. Yeah. So maybe stay oh. tuned for the space pod later this yes. week and you'll find out we'll, as we'll I quickly Google. Out. To Google, I go. <laughs> also, I'm, well, I'm hoping it has enough. Yes, we'll yes. It. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it will. There's going to be a lot of amazing <laughs> research coming out of that for exoplanets. Okay, now, so, Tim Dodd, uh, Proton launches Blagovest number 12L. That's that right. Yeah. So, That's Proton right. M launched on Wednesday, April 18th at 6.12 uh, Eastern, which was 22.12 UTC from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Let's roll that footage. <laughs> <laughs> what what is that footage? Please tell me that's what there actually is. What is that? <laughs> what is right going on here? Oh oh. First off, this is a classified payload, not a classified rocket, so I don't know how that happened. <laughs> what? Uh, this was a proton. Uh, uh, M launcher, which is their like medium class ish rocket. Um, and this was the Blago, Blago Vest 12L, which is a high uh, capacity <laughs> telecommunications satellite, which is designed to provide high speed data trans, uh, transmissions in the KA and Q band. Um, and it's one of the first satellites to actually use the, the K band frequency. Um, so that's pretty sweet. Um, the launch was initially targeted for December 25th, 2017, uh, but problems with one of the satellite's components forced Russia to postpone the mission several times. And look, now we have a picture of the thing that's supposed to be classified. What? Yet all we see is a classified thing with a bunch of flames coming out the back. <laughs> what? I'm so what kind of programming running here? What is this? <laughs> What did, I, what did I walk into here? Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, it was a, a success, and of course, as a, being a military payload, we don't know that much more about it. 
<laughs> so there it is. Good job, uh, Russia. You <laughs> that was amazing. That was so good right now. I'm glad we're actually able to see an image of it. That was a surprise to me, too. That was good. Well, um, we have some actual images for our news stories. At yes. Least, where it's not, not classified. classified. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, well, thank you so much for that, uh, Tim Todd. That was so good. So this I'm really excited to talk about because, uh, well, diamonds are just super exciting yes. overall. They're just really, really cool. But meteorite diamonds. Yeah, why okay. not? I mean, every kiss that? begins with the late heavy bombardment. Period. Okay, so maybe that that <laughs> slogan doesn't actually and work as well as I hoped it would. Um, <laughs> but you know, um, you know, diamonds are forever, and that not only helps out British secret agents, but you know, it's also scientists that are looking at what's inside of those diamonds, <laughs> things like that. So there was this incredible study that was d led by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, where they've been examining what are known as uriolites. Now these are carbon-rich meteorites that can be full of microscopic diamonds. And these diamonds, they are very itty bitty. This is a electron beam microscope image of those diamonds right there. They are very, very small. They could be a few dozen to a few hundred micrometers wide, which should give you an idea of how big that is. The average human hair is about 100 micrometers wide. Now, uriolites are also quite rare. There's fewer than 500 that have been found here on Earth. And these diamonds inside of the uriolites are thought to have formed via very powerful impacts such as uh, you know, asteroid collisions. Now, the pressure can reach high enough to transform most forms of raw carbon into the microscopic gems. But some of these uriolites, they have diamonds that are a little bit bigger, and that indicates that something with more energy had to have formed them. And they did that close examination with those electron beams during the studies by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And they also discovered that inside of these diamonds, there's crystalline bits of iron and sulfur within those diamonds, which is something that forms a sustained, extremely high pressures, we're talking like 20 gigapascals or higher. So this result suggests that these uriolites actually originated within a protoplanet roughly the size uh, between Mercury and Mars in the first 10 million years of the solar system. Uh, now there was a ton of, there was you know quite a few of these objects of that size swirling around the inner solar system um, at that time, and these specific kind of meteorites are helping us understand what these long lost forerunners to today's planets are made of. And this is an image of Vesta uh, taken by the Dawn spacecraft, uh, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. It's also basically the remnants of what would have been a protoplanet in our early solar system. Um, so something very similar to this likely has uriolites that are impregnated with that carbon and sulfur towards the inside, towards the core, if you will, the middle of it. So very cool study that they were able to do, and uh, that was uh, very entertaining to to see that, especially, I mean, yeah. everybody likes diamonds because they're shiny, so. Yeah, but so. uriolites, even that name sounds cool. Yeah, and I mean, it's the fact like, that we can know what comes from other planets, too. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting, you know, sort of these ways that we can actually figure out what the early solar system was like. So you don't necessarily yeah. have to go to a comet. You can also grab them from meteorites as well and figure that that's out. That's so, so cool. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and that's, like, so convenient, too, because that way we don't have to actually travel to far distances to, to be doing this research. We yeah. actually can get it, yeah, like, yeah. in our, in I mean, our own neighborhood. Literally, literally, in the case of meteorites, the samples come to us. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Wow. So. Well, I hope a lot of uh, incredible research is going to come out of this. I'm, I'm sure it will. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm loving a lot of the, the comments in here just about diamonds generally. Uh, but I want to jump into more talks about rockets. Really excited yeah. about this. Rock New yep. orbital ATK rocket. Yes. Yep. All right. Tell yeah. us all about well, it, Tim. This week been the, uh, the the 34th Space Symposium, which is out in uh, Colorado Springs in Colorado. So this is a time where a lot of the manufacturers kind of come around and they tend to talk about what's next. And so Orbital ATK, uh, which I believe is, how do you actually say it? Is it Orbital ATK, a division of Northrop Grumman? Is that what it is uh, these days? Orbital ATK, a space division of Northrop Grumman, right? I think that's space how division. we decided it should go. Space so division of Northrop Grumman, yes. They announced their new <laughs> rocket. And this is called the Omega. It has a capital A, so you got to pronunciate that like that. The Omega will be a mid to heavy lift launch vehicle for the Air Force's Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program, or EELV. Uh, this is a three stage booster, uh, and that's in its bare configuration. It has three stages, and the first stage is basically derived from the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Booster 
uh, pretty big, powerful solid rocket engine. Um, it's orbital, or actually ATK made the the um, the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle. The second stage is a caster uh, solid rocket motor. Again, another solid. Um, it sounds like it can do a, a potentially. Uh, I believe the first stage is maybe a 600. The second stage is a 300 um, uh, caster. And then the upper stage is going to be a dual uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne RL10 uh, cryo engine. And this is the same upper stage engine as what's on the Atlas V, but this has two RL10s, which uh, in my head means it's twice as expensive, but also <laughs> uh, a lot more capable, obviously. Those are uh, amazing <laughs> engines. Those are still some of the uh, most efficient uh, engines made, period. They're amazing engines. Um, so the crazy thing is here, this, this thing can actually have six additional strap-on solid rocket boosters. So it's basically solids on top of solids on top of solids, uh, enough <laughs> solids to uh, lift heavy stuff, I guess. Which, uh, th speaking of heavy stuff, it can do up to 22,266 pounds or 10,100 kilograms to a geostationary transfer orbit and payloads of up to about 17,000 pounds or 7,800 kilograms to geostationary and equatorial orbits. Um, so that's pretty sweet. That's pretty good. Um, it's very comparable to a, a Falcon 9, basically. Um, but the cool thing is, is this basically, so Orbital ATK is currently launching an Antares rocket for their CRS program. And that's a liquid uh, first stage, and then a solid second stage, and then a solid upper stage. This is almost <laughs> the opposite of that. It's a solid, solid, and liquid. And it's just so weird they like dabble with solids and liquids, and it's just, it's, it's a weird orbital you always surprise me i guess is what i'm trying to say here um and they're looking to launch this already in 2021 so coming up wow. you know pretty soon and they might even do a heavy class version in 2024 so that'd be sweet i don't know if that'd be three cores strapped together or what um but they're also considering launching this um out of 39b which is mm. the um basically the empty platform version of 39a it's been stripped down already by nasa ready to lease for commercial use um, that's an awesome launch pad too. It's very similar to 39A. Basically, it's brother or sister, mm -hmm. um, and it's yeah. they'll be continuing development based on if they actually get selected by the Air Force, uh, which we'll find out this summer. So yeah, Amazing. go Omega. Amazing. I actually uh, want to bring up a question I see in the chat by uh, Green Gmail. It says, how much of it is reusable, though? Do we? I, I've been seeing quite a lot of questions about uh, its reusability. Do we know if it's at all reusable? Probably not. Really not. They didn't mention anything about reusability. Okay. Um, I think they learned their lesson in the shuttle days with those solid rocket boosters. Mm. Um, solid rocket boosters are basically a giant um, shell, and these ones are going to be carbon fiber, I believe, which would be oh. uh, unique. And I think, mm -hmm. I, I don't know of it. I've never heard of any other carbon fiber uh, solid rocket booster, so that's the first I'm hearing of that. Wow. Um, but when the space shuttle splashed down its, its solid rocket boosters, it was able to parachute down and survive kind of the re-entry heating and then parachute and then just splash itself into the ocean because they're basically a big giant metal tube with a bunch of solid propellant packed inside them. But the mm -hmm. problem is by the time you recovered them, dragged them back into shore, stripped them all down, and repainted them, did all the refurbishment, it actually was more expensive than just building new ones. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think people okay. learned their lesson. Yeah, um, so, probably, so, it's not a valid way to consider reuse. So they, I don't, I haven't heard of any reuse. Plans. Yeah, solids uh, tend to be basically dirt cheap, so yeah. they're they're pretty much mm, expendable. Like ex yeah. So yeah, okay. it's all it's in you know it's just you just might as well toss it in the ocean. So. Okay, well so. I still love the idea that they can like add on. You said up to six rocket boosters. Yeah. Yeah. additional. That six is incredible. Boosters. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Talk Again, about like there's tons of solids like that. It just is. Very Kerbal Space Program, and this sounds like a very Kerbal rocket. So Just add more boosters. Yeah, that's so. that's wow. Well, that's awesome. So uh, uh, I think to lead into that would be searching for hunt, hunting for planets. Yeah. So <laughs> that's not really the best segue, but I feel like rockets. <laughs> well, you know, maybe going to other planets, but um, darkness. Yes. We'll be hunting for planets, Jared. Mm -hmm. What is this all about? Yes, from darkness comes the light of exoplanets. Ooh. That is. Uh, now, in our space pod this week, we are, or at least for me, we're going to be talking about the transiting exoplanet survey mm -hmm. satellite or test, which we talked about a little bit earlier on launch, but. In the news, I want to tell you about a good project, a very good project, uh, from some locals here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Now, they're working with an international team of researchers, and they've created an instrument that's able to tell the difference between light emitted by or light emitted by a star and light reflected by the planets coming Ooh. from that star. Um, it's definitely got one of the most intense backronyms I have ever witnessed in my nearly decade of being 
in science. <laughs> I um, that was a backronym. It stands for, it's, so the, it's called darkness, and it stands for the dark speckled near infrared energy resolved superconducting spectrophotometer. Wow. So there you go. I'm what? not I am not saying what? that again. So you got it once. You're welcome. So <laughs> Taking direct images of exoplanets is absurdly hard. It's basically like imaging a specific single speck of dust that's going around a powerful searchlight while it's hundreds of kilometers away from you. But lead researcher Benjamin Ma Mazin at UCSB and his team are hoping that darkness will help with this. Now, darkness was designed to fit the 200-inch Hale telescope at Palomar Observatory near San Diego, California, and it's a 10,000-pixel integral field spectrograph that adjusts its light collecting mirror about 2,000 times per second. So here it is. It is a instrument. So <laughs> it looks very <laughs> nondescript, like it's not actually doing much, but it actually is doing a lot. Wow. Now, changing that collection mirror and its shape 2,000 times per second, uh, this is allowing it to counteract the atmospheric distortions, and it actually generates very high contrast ratios between the two light sources, which in this case would be a star and the planet going around the star. I mean, even at thousands of frames per second of taking data and imaging, it produces zero noise in the images, and that's, uh, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is an image of a spectrograph that the European Southern Observatory uses, um, just to kind of show this off here. And uh, darkness does this with probably the coolest thing you're going to hear this week, which are microwave kinetic inductance detectors. This basically means that darkness can detect the exact arrival time and wavelength of each photon that arrives, which basically this allows it to further clean up any speckle light. Now, speckle light is scattered light from a star. You could end up mistaking it for a planet. And these contrast ratios for darkness, it enables us to find a planet that's 100 million times dimmer than the star it's orbiting. So the team is hoping that in the future they can build an instrument for the 30-meter telescope up on Mauna Kea in the future, and this would actually Using the 30-meter telescope would allow you to directly image planets in the habitable zone of nearby low-mass stars. So, holy wow. moly! Wow! What the a sick instrument they've got coming yeah. up. So, that's, there's a, a question. Me is crapping my pants. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yes, that is like. Oh. Yeah, that's so good. Oh, I actually see a question in the chat. I think it's pretty good. It's from uh, Hansi mm -hmm. Vorwerp. Says, uh, can they tell the difference because of the polarization of the reflected light, or it's some other property? Yep, it, that is a astute observation. It is. it is basically the polarization of the light coming in. So <laughs> nicely done. That is so, so cool. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited. It's going to be out in uh, where is it going to be in uh, well, Mauna Kea? Okay. It, well, they want to build one to put on Mauna Kea. They've been testing it on the 200-inch Hale Telescope at Palomar Ooh. near San Diego here in California. California, which right. uh, which is very very cool. So, <laughs> oh man, well I am super excited to see like the research that's going to be coming out of that, um, and yeah, I mean I guess. For now, that is incredible. That is a lot of news that we just mm -hmm. filled into uh, our first segment for the, the show today. So we're going to go qu to a quick calendar break, and then Jared is going to be interviewing Kale, and I'm super excited for this. Yes. So stay tuned, and I will catch you guys soon. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into our interview segment today, we've got to give a huge shout out to our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks, of course, give us $10 or more per episode on Patreon, or $30 a month or more on Maker Support. And of course, where would we be without our Orbital citizens as well? Now, these folks give us $5 per episode or more on Patreon, or $15 a month or more on Maker 
maker support. And in return, you get your name in the show twice. You get voting rights and upcoming roundtable discussions, free worldwide shipping from our tomorrow swag store, and so much more. And of course, every little bit helps. Thank you guys so much uh, for helping us out with the show, because we really can't do the show, and we can't bring these amazing things that we get to talk about with you without your help. And if you would like to help crowdfund and become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO or makersupport.com slash TMRO. Now, I'm really excited about our interview today because this is uh, this is something I have always wondered about and always wanted to talk someone uh, to someone about, and now I get to talk to someone about it. And I've got Kale Vahayakola here today. Hopefully, I got did I get that right this time? Yeah, it's excellent. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And you are from Space Nation, uh, and we're very excited to have you on the show today. Um, why don't we go ahead and just outright ask, what is Space Nation? Yeah, so maybe one way to put it is that uh, while uh, many people build like rockets and uh, satellites and stuff like that, so we provide uh, means and experiences for everyday people, you, me, and, and others to be part of the new space era. And one part of, the, of it is, of course, a Space Nation astronaut program, the first global astronaut program where anyone in the world, you, me, others, have a shot to get to space and become an astronaut for real. So when you say astronaut program, are you talking about like, like the training to become an astronaut? Is that, is that the kind of stuff that you're doing? Uh, that is one part of it. So we just soft launched our Space Nation Navigator app, basically. Uh, actually, at the uh, Yuri's Night uh, LA just a week ago. And you can start trading like an astronaut through that. And by the end of the year, we will select 100 best candidates to go to on-site trading beginning of next year with the same astronaut trainers that train the NASA astronauts and aim to send like first person into space next year. And we repeat this every year, basically. So the visit to space, to orbit, uh, and moon and beyond uh, in the future. So you're, so the goal of Space Nation is essentially to take, uh, if you will, civilians, people who aren't like, uh, like professional scientists or career military and things like that, and enable them to become astronauts. Yeah, exactly. So uh, basically, this part of it is also demystifying what an astronaut is. So those things, as you said, uh, are especially in people and has been areas to become an astronaut. Uh, and in the future, uh, it's going to be a bit different. So of course, we are going to have like uh, space uh, stations, uh, commercial ones. We are going to have space cities, space hotels, and uh, you could think about it as a bit like taking an airplane now. So you have a pilot, you have a stewardess or other crew there, and you have passengers. And in the future, going to space is a bit uh, the same. And depending what you are, what you're going to do there, uh, depends what you are going to be trained like, basically. So with the training that you guys are going to be doing, are you looking at sort of going through avenues that are different from the way a traditional astronaut would become, uh, like going specifically through uh, NASA or the European Space Agency? Or, uh, or are you sort of looking at enabling traditional, or are you looking at enabling a combination of both? Well, in the future, it's a bit combination of, uh, of all, and there will be different venues. At the moment, as I said, like uh, when downloading our app, you can start to do these missions that uh, help your body, mind, and social. So basically, basic health, fitness things. Uh, you can train uh, then mind uh, things like creative problem solving, logical thinking, uh, learning new things, applying them. And then, of course, social aspects like teamwork above all. And based on your... Uh, uh, performance there, we give you points, and the best people that get the most points, we even interview and ultimately get uh, the best candidates on site training and with the NASA astronaut trainers. It all is based uh, at the moment like NASA astronaut training and, and the curriculums from there are needs, uh, but we are going to be going to do it uh, ultimately depending what is your destination or your mission in space that uh, uh, differentiates uh, what is the actual topical tracks or needs for you to be trained like. But of course, it has similarities. Like uh, uh, if you go to the orbit, uh, uh, there are a lot of similarities as with NASA or ESA or other space agency training has uh, currently. 
Now, you guys have a app, uh, which is called Space Nation Navigator, um, and that's, uh, that's kind of how you learn the skills. Can you tell us a little bit about how the app works um, and what you actually do with the app? Yeah, so basically at the moment it's at the Google Play Store, so you can download it there. Uh, and the iPhone is coming like uh, uh, on the upcoming week or, or in two weeks about. Uh, and here you basically have your access point of like additional information about uh, going to space and stories that we have in our Space Nation Orbit, which is kind of a first uh, a lifestyle magazine around space. Uh, then we have like missions here that you can do like singular missions and then you have a little bit like storyline as a weekly adventure uh, where you basically uh, use the new learned stuff uh, to basically uh, uh, adopt them in the new circumstances. But there you basically have uh, missions, for example, uh, physical missions. So where you actually need to go to uh, out and, and walk or run and, and we measure things from that. Or then the uh, logical missions, so like uh, problem solving and then when we add up like factors like uh, uh, that you need to do it in certain time, then it adds up like pressure. Uh, uh, some of those have like multitasking. Uh, you learn, need to learn new languages. Of course, if you go to the International Space Station, you need to learn, uh, 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 in addition to English, uh, Russian also. So these are the few uh, aspects that you can uh, do there. But I recommend that uh, every one of you download and of course try it out and see yourself. Now, um, with gathering up all the points, that leads to you going in, actually getting into the process of uh, potentially starting your training um, to become an astronaut through Space Nation. Um, what does that look like? Like, what, what is the process and what is the timeline after you have gotten enough points to get considered? Yeah, so uh, basically the uh, app is now out and uh, it will be like in about the three and a half month cycles we make like major feature updates and uh, content up updates. It includes like this 12 week uh, tropical track now. And the last cycle uh, of this year, like the last quarter, then we start uh, the global selection phase. So then the people that have the app can do the missions and gather points and see their uh, like uh, development inside we of course monitor all that and ultimately before the end of the year select the 100 best candidates and and uh, uh, those we then interview and and involved with psychologists also and beginning of next year around february uh, we'll take these people to an on-site training location uh, with the astronaut trainers now, are there some limiting factors uh, in in sort of moving forward with the astronaut training? Um, because most of the time, if a, if someone's rejected um, during astronaut candidacy when they're figuring that out at NASA, it's usually like health related and stuff like that. Are are there still these considerations involved, even though you're sort of going a different way than than a traditional uh, uh, science uh, agency would go? Yeah, so basically when you use, of course, the flight provider uh, providers, uh, they have uh, restrictions. And if you go to the orbit, as you said, uh, currently, um, you can't have like things like a heart condition, for example. Uh, you need to have a basic health. You don't need to be a superman uh, or superwoman uh, with your fitness, so to speak. Uh, that is more needed if you go to like uh, EVAs, meaning like space box and, and stuff like that. Uh, of course, there are size limitations. You can't be uh, basically too uh, tall, for example, or too heavy. Uh, and uh, those, if you take like a Soyuz capsule, uh, are restrictions that we currently have. And of course, the future SpaceX uh, Dragon capsules that uh, that take have a different kind of uh, parameters on there. And of course, suborbital flights have their own parameters. And at the moment, uh, through us, uh, you need to be an adult, basically. So if you're younger, you can start the training and, and get ready. And of course, having a better shot when you are an adult uh, to get to space through our program. But uh, at the moment, it's for adults. Yeah, and I like to see that you know, uh, you know, the height requirement. Uh, that's a very interesting one. 
um, the Soyuz. I know since I'm six foot three, I probably violate that. Um, but someone I know who doesn't violate it has commented in our chat room, uh, Mini Stoge. Um, she's asking if the top candidates from the app will need to be from certain countries, or is it kind of open access to everyone who's going to be with it? Because I know here in the United States, we have to deal with ITAR and restrictions with that and things like that. So is this something that you guys have to take into consideration? Um, and is that you or is that the, the provider that you have to take into consideration with it? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, as my background, like uh, coming from a, a physicist, like uh, uh, life is all about approximations and the approximation in this case is like everyone can, of course. So uh, it'll be in uh, every country the app available and we can, but depending of course on the uh, destination. So if we talk about like suborbital flights, but then we have a high uh, flexibility from people uh, of different nationalities and all around the world. Uh, if we are talking to the International Space Station, uh, of course, there are at least at the moment, uh, uh, if I recollect uh, right, like four countries that are so uh, blacklisted uh, on the on the U.S. side that uh, can't uh, uh, at the moment to get like to International Space Station. Of course, there will be other sp uh, uh, space stations like our partner Axiom Space is building the first commercial space station, Axiom Space Station, uh, and uh, uh, there are other ventures on that field, uh, so they might have uh, different restrictions. And of course, the Chinese will have their own space stations. So depending on the destination, but uh, roughly said, everyone can at the moment. Excellent, that's awesome that you can get everybody together. Um, to go to our, our Twitch uh, viewers, Henny's Vorweep uh, has a, very interesting um, question uh, that I'm it's kind of combining some of uh, the really great questions that Hanny's group has been uh, um, thrown in, which is uh, Would your certification be recognized by launch companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin or Russia? Um, and they were also asking, you know, about partnerships and who you're working with. Um, is there anyone in the future you're working with or anyone you're working with right now that you can kind of talk about? Uh, well, a uh, few. So, so um, uh, as I said, like Axiom Space is our partner, and uh, like uh, NASA, we have a space act agreement, and uh, we partnered officially. Uh, and and there's some other uh, space agencies. So in the future, we are um, partnering with all the space agencies because we are local and and view the world kind from the kind uh, kind of from the overview effect. So looking it down uh, and rather than looking from down here up. Uh, and uh, think about the certification. So uh, there, at the moment, isn't much certification if needed. For example, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, these kind of uh, uh, vehicles. Uh, of course, like uh, if we are talking about uh, Roscosmos and Soyuz capsule, uh, there is a, a certain strict uh, uh, training that you need to go through in, in order to be certified. Uh, and we plan to do that ultimately when we select uh, our best candidates. So uh, let's say that uh, our second year of Space Nation Astronaut Program, uh, meaning that 2019 uh, fall selection, 2020 uh, spring, uh, the on-site training. Through that final, basically, the best candidate goes to the International Space Station. And if we are going to use like a Soyuz capsule, uh, uh, so those need to go through us, basically, that uh, need a training uh, at Star City, Russia, and, and uh, other places that certifies to fly with Soyuz capsule. So once again, depending what we use, uh, we will arrange the needed uh, training for that. And uh, to kind of uh, <laughs> combine um, a few questions together, Space Vogel is asking um, who pays for all of the trading, and and then uh, Vogon in our our chat room also says, "I want to be certified. Where do I send the money?" Um, as well, so this is you know you're definitely getting the attention of uh, of our viewers today. That's for sure. So what do you, so yeah. who pays for it? So, is it like is it the agency that actually handles it? Do you guys handle it? Do you need to bring some with you? How does it work? So, so basically, uh, uh, our program is more like meritocratic, meaning that uh, based on your development and achievement through the app and on-site training, you can get certified. But money can't play uh, straight through us, uh, at least not yet, like certifications. There are companies in the world that uh, can create this kind of a uh, 
uh, certifications and training with money, and, and uh, you need to pay depending what kind of certification. It might be up to millions to, to get certified uh, to fly with uh, uh, Soyuz capsule, for example. Uh, but how, we, uh, how it is all paid? So basically, you as a candidate, uh, you don't ultimately uh, might not need to pay anything. So that's how we make it so that everyone can, uh, regardless the economic stature or degree of education, through uh, just starting through our program, like developing yourself. And uh, we basically monetize uh, uh, the app side. So there's a premium model, meaning that you can, uh, with micro payments, get some uh, extra missions, unlock them, or retry. But uh, also, if you don't want to pay, then you uh, are exposed to rewarded advertisement, basically video ads. Uh, so in either way, we get uh, monetized by that, and that way we can pay all the training. And we also will film and video all the on-site training uh, distributed in, uh, online in different means and uh, uh, with broadcasters later on also. So with sponsors advertising micropayments, we plan to uh, fund it all, basically. Yeah, so uh, to kind of talk a little bit about that, Travis Neal on YouTube um, kind of wants to know about the, like the revenue streams. Do they focus on the customers or the candidates or things uh, like that? Like, where does it where does it specifically focus on uh, with that? Yeah, so those who use the app site basically and, and start to train, uh, either as I said, like uh, with advertisement uh, and sponsors there, or then direct micro payments uh, from the users, consumers from there. But uh, then when we are talking about uh, filming the on-site training, uh, then we are talking more about like sponsors and advertisers at that moment, basically. And of course, as uh, the Space Nation Astronaut Program is actually one program that we do in Space Nation. So all different kind of experiences uh, and media uh, to make uh, space warm, close and relatable for new audiences, not just the space enthusiasts and geeks like myself, <laughs> but for everyone. And, and that's what we are building like with the Space Nation Orbit, first lifestyle magazine of space, uh, merchandising that we are going to roll out. And uh, there's other cool stuff coming. And we've also already like uh, licensed Space Nation kits, for example. So uh, there's a whole variety of uh, products, whether it's our own or license that we're creating and, and all these ad subs. Uh, to a business model that we can fund, uh, not just the uh, flights to space, but like the training and uh, other aspects also. Nice. Uh, now, Hanny Zvorwerp in Twitch, who's been like reeling in the great questions today, um, is asking, how long does the certification last? Is it like one or two years? Do you have to go back and, you know, like uh, with, with like your pilot's license, you have to get your medical certification every certain number of years? Um, is there a recertification process? Uh, for for your astronaut training, how how does it work? Uh, well, uh, that's actually a good question. So, like once again, depending uh, what flight provider we are using. So, at the moment, for example, uh, Axiom Space is uh, handling our uh, flight training, meaning that if you go with a uh, whether it's a SpaceX or if you fly with the Soyuz capsules, uh, they will arrange the training for that. And uh, of course, if the uh, generally like rule of thumb, if the uh, capsule that you're flying with or, or the vehicle uh, is the same, uh, like let's say two years after your training, uh, then basically you're certified in, in that sense to uh, uh, fly with that then also. Uh, but uh, I can't give at the moment like a full certainty that if there needs to be a, like an update or, or for that certificate, then is it how many years it lasts basically. Yeah, but that, that's a good question. Yeah, I was going to say uh, that's that's a problem I don't think we've had in the past. Um, <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. That's, <laughs> that's uh, so new that even I haven't like uh, yeah. pumped into that yet. But uh, I definitely get uh, get to the bottom of that. Yeah, how cool is it that we now have like this ability to access space that we're like developing new problems for uh, for like certifications <laughs> and things like that. Um, no, the, I, I think these are fun and positive uh, problems or challenges to solve. Yeah, I really like it. <laughs> it's, it's so cool. Uh, now, Neuropilot from our chat room uh, is asking a question that I was going to ask, so we might as well have Neuropilot ask it. Uh, is do you have any veteran or flown cosmonauts involved? And I guess I'll sort of expand that out. Do you have anybody in Involved, uh, you know, personally involved in spaceflight, uh, helping you guys out. Uh, well, but, uh, yes. Uh, so um, 
we developed the whole program with the same NASA astronaut trainers that uh, train the NASA astronauts uh, on the continent and went through that uh, inside and they will be on the on-site training too. Uh, on the cosmonaut side, it's actually like uh, we don't have uh, yet a cosmonaut uh, person involved. Uh, we have an astronaut actually, and we haven't come public with that yet. But like uh, in uh, upcoming weeks, we will roll out also him and and, and uh, the maybe let's give a hint like uh, uh, if you are really good in in uh, googling or internet, you might actually found it out already. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, there's also some other stuff I want to talk about with you guys because you're not necessarily just this this app to get uh, get you into astronaut training. Um, you guys actually have office you know, office space in space, if you will, with Space Nation Labs, right? Yeah, uh, we actually have like a, uh, we can send stuff to uh, the International Space Station, and here, for example, for the camera viewers. Uh, uh, something that has been there. So we sent these uh, radish sheets, for example, uh, they came uh, back with the Dragon capsule a year ago, uh, it was uh, almost half a year on board the International Space Station. And those are actually for kids, so like kids can learn the scientific method through them. So they have space radish sheets and they have normal radish sheets. Uh, before they grow them, they make like a hypothesis, like how are they different? Then they make observations when growing and test their hypothesis. So it's a fun and engaging way for them to learn about the uh, scientific methods. But yeah, we have uh, space there. Yeah, and you guys also have Space Nation Kids, where you guys uh, sort of engage in, uh, in STEM education as well with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, the basically, uh, Space Nation Kids, we have licensed to a company called Fun Academy, and uh, they have kindergartens all over the world. And they've created already like a 12 week program for the kindergarten kids about astronaut training. And they make the, all the kindergarten teachers as future astronaut trainers. So, uh, as you said, like there's a broader angle what we are doing in Space Nation. It's not just sending few people to space uh, and, uh, at the one or it is about astronaut skills because we view that those are kind of like life skills that are beneficial for everyone. As I said, like healthy lifestyle, creative problem of solving, learning new things, applying them, and teamwork above all. So we want like broader audiences to try out the app and be engaged on that, uh, especially because they see that it's fun and engaging and beneficial for your personal life. And that is in the DNA of all we do. So if I make like a, a few other words to say that, as you know, uh, we live kind of like the coolest time to be alive uh, when thinking about like humanity going to space. Uh, and, and I believe that it's like a key moment in human evolution, what we are doing, uh, and our future prosperity is based on that uh, when we go to space. But we want to make sure that uh, everyone can be part of that and enjoy the tangible benefits of it all, whether it's the new perspective, uh, which is generally called as the only effect that astronauts have. So uh, that's we're aiming to be uh, uh, and toward that. That uh, let's say that in a couple of uh, years, uh, when people think space, they will think space nation because that's their access point to concretely be part of this and, and engage in different experiences and media. All right, Kale, thank you so much. I feel like on that, uh, that's just a, a perfect dot to end on uh, with it today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, just real quick, if people want to know more about you uh, and Space Nation, where should they go? So you can go to spacenation.org, and of course you can go to the Google Play Store and download the Space Nation Navigator app or follow us uh, on social media at Space Nation. Excellent. All right, Kale, thank you so much for coming on today. And now we're going to head in to a quick break. And when we come back from break, your comments from last week's show. So stay tuned. There's more tomorrow just after this. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. 
And here we are again to wrap up the show with your comments and questions. But before we do that, we got to thank our Escape Velocity citizens. These folks, you know, they give us $10 or more per episode on Patreon and $30 a month or more on Maker Support. And of course, we also have our Orbital citizens, $5 or more on Patreon per episode, and $10 or more on Maker Support per month. But did you know that we have suborbital citizens as well? Yeah, these folks, they contribute $2.50 per episode on Patreon, or $5 a month on Maker Support. And in return, they get their name in the third segment of the show, free US shipping from our tomorrow swag store, and so much more. And of course, every little bit helps us out here at tomorrow, and you know, doesn't just help us out with tomorrow space, helps us out with tomorrow science, it helps us out with everything behind the scenes, <coughs> all the stuff we're building. Oh, it's so amazing. I just, I almost died uh, there. So it's so, helps so us out cool. With not dying. Yes, helps us out with no dying. Um, yes, it's just been, and if you would like to see the complete re list of rewards, or if you'd like to help become a citizen of tomorrow, you can head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO or makersupport.com slash TMRO. Help us out because every little bit helps and we're appreciative of that so yes we got some stuff to talk about we got lots of stuff so last week i'm sure if you guys joined us you will have known that we were joined by rod pile i'm, I'm doing it again i'm looking at all the different cameras okay um this one right Okay, mm -hmm. so we were joined by Rod Pyle. We spoke, we spoke about the International uh, Space Development Conference, and uh, we spoke about also how to build a Death Star. So it was a really interesting conversation. Minor Saturday afternoon conversation. Interesting stuff. So. Yeah, lots lots of fun so, stuff. Some sunflowers yeah. were involved. Um, so yeah, was, you should go back and watch that. Yeah, so. or I think that was after dark. You'll get it in a couple weeks. Oh so. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. So <laughs> there's a blast I had really trying to pick out all of your comments. So the first comment comes to us off of YouTube by Martin Stenswagen. He says, that hotel is so tiny. One launch with BFR would, could deliver something twice as wide alone. I uh, brought this question up because I wanted to ask you guys about how much you might have actually known about the scale of the BFR. I see Tim Dodd. I'll point to Tim. Nodding his head. <laughs> <laughs> That is a hot topic right now, actually, because uh, this week when we were going to talk about the Port of L.A., SpaceX uh, officially kind of signed and got everything squared away to build the BFR in L.A., which is awesome, uh, at the Port of Los Angeles. And, of course, uh, people are like kind of getting all these spy shots and confirming that they believe it's still that 9-meter diameter, which is, what, 30 feet wide or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and... Uh, but at the same time, the the guy that was uh, the construction manager for SpaceX said around 35 feet, which made people go, oh, maybe mm. it's 10 meters wide. So now everyone's all up in a huff again, and the Internet's, uh, you know, crapping their pants trying to figure out how big is the gift <laughs> And oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, it's a it's a, a bi-monthly game at this point. I feel like it changes whenever someone opens their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in theory, between nine and ten meters wide, and uh, which is huge. That's twice yeah. as big, basically, as any other uh, current operational fairing that I know of. Or is there anything bigger than that right now than five meter fairing? Uh, I oh, think the Ariane five uh, payload fairing is the largest in the world because mm -hmm. they picked because James the James Webb Space Telescope team specifically picked that because uh, it was the biggest one they could actually fold up the James Webb Space Telescope into whenever it launches um, you know so yeah yeah also cool yeah so that was in reference to the um, the space hotel so yes. that's what the, really the question was because that was really good Ben was talking about that last time during news just want to point out two yes. weeks uh, from now on May 5th uh, thank you Minnie Stoge uh, for pointing this out to us uh, we're gonna have Orion Span's CEO <gasps> Frank Bunger on the show for Orbit 11.18. Um, so Frank Bunger uh, is the CEO of Orion Span, which is the luxury space hotel mm -hmm. uh, that they're talking oh. about. So we're going to actually talk to the people. Um, and then we can uh, we can ask them about it. Yeah, and be like, Dude, that's what's good. Up? That's good. So what awesome. are you launching on? So now so, more inclined to, to tune in that, that week. So, yeah. uh, and it's also the, the launch of the Insight. 
mission, which is going to be that yeah. morning. So oh that's going to be gosh. crazy. You and I are probably going to be there together and drive in for it. <laughs> Thank you for but, reminding me about my no sleep exciting. weekend that yeah, weekend. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I think it launches at like 4 a.m. All right. So yeah. our next comment comes off of Twitch from Henny's for Weep Werp Werp for like all the yeah. amazing comments that you had uh, for our interview today. Yeah, that's a, uh, th I just want to point that out. That's an awesome name because that's a name of a specific object that is studied. Uh, I believe it's like some kind of bright radio quasar that does something weird that other bright radio oh. quasars don't do. Um, so what? sick name. I got that reference. All so, right. Yeah. I love that. I love that you brought that up. I actually didn't know that. That's amazing. So um, they say, what is the percentage of general public engagement for space that consists of sci-fi television shows versus formal education? And I thought this was really cool. I ended up doing a little bit of research on IMDb for shows that were mainly educational based um, in the subject matter of space versus more science fiction shows. Um, so I wanted to just share like two of them with you guys. I have a whole bunch here, but The Expanse was about 8.3 out of 10 rating okay. based on 49,000 voters on IMDb. But then you have the educational shows like Cosmos, and I know it's a bit of an exception because Carl Sagan and the Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, but that mm -hmm. had a rating of 9.3 out of 10 with about 84,000 voters on IMDb. Um, and then it, it was actually quite a lot different than when you look at then Star Trek, and then I um, compared it also to Nova, which is another more educational-based um, show. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were a bit more... more uh, Dramatic. So to kind of answer the, that question, I've noticed that uh, science fiction really does make a big impact when trying to actually educate the public on science. And I think it has to do with the whole that fantasy and the creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys think about that? Just personal experiences with science fiction shows versus more educational based Yeah, um, I guess I'll just go ahead and say that uh, I freaking love Star Wars. Um, yeah. And like a lot of my interest in space was started by Star Wars as a kid. Mm -hmm. And once I started learning about how things actually worked in space, that got me like even more hooked, um, both on like Star Wars, because I started figuring out how do things in Star Wars work, yeah. um, and also like Oh, this is how things actually work, too. Mm -hmm. um, and really, a lot of thing, too, um, is that it's not necessarily the, the difference between uh, the ability of, of science fiction and a like, science documentary to connect with you. To mm -hmm. me, it's the actual individual ability of like, scientists and researchers and other folks to communicate. That's really where yeah. the lacking part comes in. Um, because the reason that stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek uh, connects with people so much is that it tells a story, um, and a story that you can see yourself becoming a part of. Um, and it's really difficult to do that. As a scientist or an engineer or a researcher, mm -hmm. it's not impossible because that's what we do up at Griffith Observatory. We do that all the time. Yeah. Um, but you have to put the effort in, and that's something that we really like, kind of miss. So, yeah. Yeah, I, Tim, how do you I feel about that? Me, personally, I'm a big fan of uh, like hard science fiction. You know, like like mm -hmm. The Martian, mm -hmm. where it's pretty darn realistic. It's based in near future you know and it's 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 a situation that you can easily actually see happening in the next 10 years yes. hopefully not yes. we don't strand anyone on mars uh, <laughs> or also a good blend to me is the nat geo mars uh series yes where they took a documentary approach and also inter interwove it with a, a storyline a, a science fiction but again hard science fiction mm -hmm. storyline i love that i think that's a, a really cool way to yeah. get people involved get them caught up to speed on what's happening now and, and in the recent past, and then get them excited about what's going to be happening in the very near future. Um, and Jared, I 100% agree that it's hard sometimes for engineers and scientists um, to be storytellers. And even if they mm -hmm. are amazing storytellers, there's something about, um, there's this division sometimes between uh, if someone has a PhD or they're a doctor and they open their mouth, they get put up on a pedestal, unfortunately, in our society. And a lot of people, even if they could be 100% related to, might just go, uh, I won't understand this. And they'll just tune out. Even though the person might be the most down-to-earth, best storyteller out there, there's something about our society that, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, Astro, uh, Nicole Stott was at Yuri's Night. And I was mm -hmm. talking to someone, and and they were like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to talk to her. I'm like, why? What? She's an awesome person. Yes. Go speak to her, you know? It's... I don't get what it like. I, ugh. Yeah, it's it. That's where science fiction, though, is is so important. The storytelling and and actually uh, getting people involved and on whatever level they're at and whatever level they're comfortable with, because they just might not be comfortable 
going up and talking to an astronaut. Yeah, I don't know. It, it is intimidating yeah. to do that because here's a person who's done something that only like 560 mm -hmm. people have actually done, um, and you know that's like that's rarer than you know summoning Mount Everest. So like, yeah, holy moly. So <laughs> yeah, but they're also people too, and you can there's a in you know a lot of them have this really great ability to humanize uh, the aspect uh, of space flight. Like I think about Mike Massimino who uh, who talks about all of his Hubble missions. Mm -hmm. um, he went on. Um, or um, uh, 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 Story Musgrave, who I've heard talk a couple times, who's just like, uh, just amazing group of people, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I definitely think that um, one thing at least that the science fiction can do as opposed to um, more educational learning is is being able to bring that 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 gap to be a, a bit smaller because a lot of people do have that intimidation factor in there from people that are they feel are much hyper yeah. hyper intelligent compared to them um, yeah. but okay well I'm going to move on to the next sure. uh, next comment I would literally stay on this for for a while maybe this could be a, a round table discussion because I see a lot of comments in here about just how inspired a lot of you guys have been through um, like science fiction shows and I think that's incredible but the um, next comment I really want to get to is off of YouTube from old gamer noob and uh, they say vacation on the moon watch earth rise this was in quotes and they say uh might be out of luck there they were quoting ben uh you'll only get an orbital earth rise while going around the moon but the earth would be stationary in the lunar sky at all times while on the surface it would look cool though yeah ben is wrong so. it turns out so uh yeah so just uh just a reminder um yeah. about that. I, so, know, I decided to, to bring uh, this image up, which I thought was just like absolutely beautiful. And, and this actually is titled Earthrise on the NASA yes. website. Well, that's Apollo it's, 8. It, 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 exactly. Orbit. That's the photo. Yep. Yeah. So, the Apollo spacecraft is, is in orbit, therefore it was able to see the Earthrise. But if yeah. you're sitting on the surface, yeah, tidally locked, that Earth ain't moving. No, it's not. Yeah. And you know what's so cool about that is that you could literally point like a telescope with an instrument at the Earth. Yeah. And study it. And you don't have to move the telescope. That's <laughs> like, one reason so why great. I want to go to the moon. <laughs> you can do like atmospheric studies and reflectance of light and other things like that on the moon. You don't need to do it from an orbital platform <laughs> where you look at a small part of the Earth as you orbit around. You could do the whole dang disk at one time. <laughs> like, holy moly, please, please take a telescope with you out there. Take a look at it. Just get me the data. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think it'd be so great too, because like also during um, sunrise or anything like that, it's just the whole sky is is black. Like and you're not gonna, <laughs> like there's there's no atmosphere on the moon, so you're not gonna have like those gorgeous sunsets like what we have obviously out here in like Malibu and stuff. But um, <laughs> so because you know no scattering of the sunlight, but um, it's it's still you know it would be really cool. Yeah, um, just want to point out, uh, yeah. Kurt's maze does have a point in the chat room, mm -hmm. uh, which is that you could get a slow Earth rise at the sides of the moon uh, relative to viewing the Earth due to the libration and lunation of the moon, which is sort of the wiggle, if you will, of the moon when it orbits around the Earth. So <laughs> technically speaking, I guess Ben was right. But, uh, uh, yeah. but also, no, he's wrong. He didn't specify so. where on the moon we would Yeah, he didn't specify. So, so yeah. And in science, specificity is everything. Um, here we go back to communicating things, Ben. Uh, so he's wrong. Awesome. So, I believe it. <laughs> This, uh, this next comment um, also comes off of YouTube. It's a C Beddo 19, and uh, it's was, it was pretty cool. They say, uh, "Love the 4K moon footage." One thing was disappointing, though. NASA obviously erased all of the alien bases off the backside of the moon. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. Um, and we all know the moon is actually made of cheese. So those fake mineral maps were pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> all kidding aside, the Rod Pyle interview was great. I like Rod's answer to, why are we doing this? My answer is less eloquent because it's awesome. I wish we could vote with 5%. I really did love uh, Rod's answers um, to a lot of those, those uh, last five questions that you usually mm -hmm. ask on the interviews. So good, it's so insightful. Um, I just also, I just love this comment because it's like the moon's obviously cheese. So yeah. I had to select obviously. that one. What obviously. What cheese is the moon made out of though? That's all I know, provolone. So provolone? Provolone. Okay. What cheese do you guys want the moon to be made of? Moon cheese. Mozzarella? Mozzarella is so, good. I was gonna say Swiss. Swiss cheese. Because so, it's reflective Guess, of light and there's holes in it and there's holes in the moon with the craters. So. Yeah, 
But they don't really go all the way through. It's just kind of like dense. That's why I said provolone because the provolone actually has like little dense. I've never in it. looked at provolone that close before. I, like I have something cheese. to do later today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My cheese knowledge is very out of date and inaccurate. So. At least I knew something that was white, right? Isn't mozzarella white? Gosh. Oh, no. oh man, the science of moon cheese. Yes, Sir Game a lot. I like that. My uh, moonzarella. Moonzarella. <laughs> How do you say that? Z web I. Par- I like that. Par- Parmesan regular. Par- Par- <laughs> These are great <laughs> suggestions. These are all gonna go on t-shirts. Everyone gets a t-shirt. Yep, there's the t-shirt for the show. I think moonzarella is the t-shirt. Moonzarella is the best. Yeah, thank you so much for that one. That's oh, just. Oh man, just <laughs> that's great. That's great. <laughs> Oh, All right, cheese. that's enough uh, yeah, cheese. Yeah, enough, enough on cheese. Okay, There's so, enough from um, us. Yeah, is, so this so. Uh, next comment, uh, this will be actually the last comment. Uh, it comes off of YouTube from uh, Night Light A, B, C, D. And um, <laughs> I chose the very beginning of the comment. It says, great show, but I think a few hours of weightlessness, I'd be ready to come back home, uh, but I'd be stuck there. The best part of this, referring to the space hotel, would be getting there and the return. But if uh, there was a rotating space hotel with gravity, uh, that would really open up space. And I think that's great because it's really about opening up space to everybody. And if you have a space hotel, that's like awesome because yeah, a lot of people are so um, like like discouraged from going to space. A lot of people I know that I ask that or maybe aren't in the space community. They're like, oh, I don't want to do it because then like, what if I'm stuck up there? And it's like, well, if you have a hotel, it's like you know, you go up there, you got a little robot, yeah. and you're good, mm-hmm. and then you come back after like a couple weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. Would you guys but, go up there for vacation? Yes, absolutely. Yep. I would love to go for vacation. I would prefer to go live and work in space. Yes, um, yeah, same. because as, as Vax Headroom is mentioning in our chat room, Ger- Gerard O'Neill for the win, and that's like basically my entire inspiration for this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would absolutely. Heck yeah, I would go. I mean, I want to go. I want to go on a suborbital flight. I don't oh, care. Same. I don't care if it same. actually crosses sixty-two miles or not. I just want to strap me in, baby. Let's go. I'm down. I don't want to work in space. I just want to hang out. I want to be a space tourist. But I'm confused by this thing. Why are they saying they're worried about getting stuck up there, but then they're saying, like, the solution to getting stuck is artificial gravity? That's what it's inferring almost. But if there is a rotating space hotel with gravity, that would really open up space as opposed to, you know, if you're, uh, in, uh, you know, like floating around in the hotel. Does the hotel – Well, I'm kind of confused by that. I, are we? T- I mean, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about like long-term stays in space, sure, mm-hmm. you need, you definitely prefer artificial gravity for that. Uh, it's you know, going to be a space hotel for more than a year, yeah. right? I mean, I mean, what that's was kind of uh, our benchmark? I mean, Orion, like Orion Span was talking about doing like what f- ten to fourteen day trips yeah. to their thing. That's like, I mean, you know, when uh, when some of the spaceflight participants who have gone to the International Space Station, you know, we spent like ten days up there, um, like uh, like Mark Shuttleworth or Richard Garriott, that I can think of, or Anush and Sorry, um, mm-hmm. you know, they came back and they just walked right out of the Soyuz capsule. So I mean, like, it's it's not that difficult. I kind of want, like, I spend my whole life, you know, experiencing one G. I want to experience zero G. Like, yeah. I don't want artificial gravity in my space hotel. Give me that. Weightlessness. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm down. So. Yeah, an interesting point I actually see in the chat is from uh, Manumus11. They say most people would love to experience artificial gravity. Most people are scared of staying somewhere with no gravity and then coming back and suffering with the with the bones, etc. I'm, I'm just, guessing bone density is what they're referring to. We had a <sighs> roundtable once about that. I just don't feel the like impacts. I, you know, I haven't like actually read the papers on it, but mm-hmm. I feel like a 10 to 14 day stay in space is not going to. It's not going to yeah. impact you as yeah. bad as you think it is. So I'd so. say yeah, about doing like a 14 day, which is like really the ideal. Anyway, if you do go on vacation, normally it's not like super long anyway, but to go to space, um, I think this really would be more so in reference yeah. to those that would be up there for a lot longer and radiation. I'm, I'm more concerned about like like uh, uh, the motion sickness that you experience for the first couple of days you yeah. know, in space. That's more my concern with that as how you're going to react to that kind of. Yeah. Like so. Yeah, and then Dada brings up also your eyes change shape. I mean, I already have a really bad astigmatism, so I'm trying to click it. There we go. Okay, <laughs> like, I'm trying to click it. I click someone else. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah, but that, that's really interesting because yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I think we actually did we do a side pod on that? Space I think pod? we did. did. I, I want to say that. that. We t- well, 
you talked about <laughs> yeah, it. Talk, at least. Talked about it, yeah, before. Let's see, you either talked about it in news or, or that. So yeah, yeah. so um, if you guys so. want to learn more, go check out all yeah. of our other videos. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, space size. On that note, um, I am going to give a huge thank you to our ground support citizens again um, because this was truly an amazing show, and I want to thank you guys. We couldn't have done this without you. Yeah. Um, these people contribute uh, one dollar per episode on Patreon or one dollar a month on Maker Support, and in return they get access to After Dark as soon as it's posted on demand and access to our exclusive citizen-only hangouts and so much more. Every bit does help and we really would not be able to continue doing these awesome shows if it wasn't for you guys. So seriously, thank you so, so much. Thanks. And if you guys want to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro. And I'm really excited, actually, for next week because we have yes. Holly Griffith coming. And she's going to be talking about NASA, space, science, STEM, uh, women in STEM, Star Wars, uh, inspir inspiring scientists and engineers, <gasps> and science and science fiction. So, like, all the questions that we pretty much were kind of talking about in the second comment today. Oh, my gosh. You guys will definitely want to tune in for that one because yes. lots of science. science yeah, fiction. that's going to be really cool. And I'm interested yeah. in hearing every little bit about that discussion. All the yeah. this, this newsletter interests me, and I would like to subscribe. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, if you guys are watching live, we are going to go into After Dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, for everyone else, we will catch you guys next time. Yep. Thank you so much for tuning in. It was such a great conversation. Bye, guys. See you guys. High fives. <laughs>